Welcome to the We're Libertarians 2020 presidential debate series. Guys, we got a good one for you, the environment debate. Uh, this is the ninth part in a 10-part series uh, where we have invite every candidate for president, not just libertarians, to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues. T today, I am joined by Daniel Berman, Arvind Vora, Max Abramoff, and Benjamin Letter, all candidates running for president here. Uh, and we'll be discussing the environment. Candidates, you'll have two minutes to answer the questions. At the end of your allotted time, I'll simply say time. Please quickly wrap up your thought. I have a mute button. I really don't want to use it. Uh, and you can, if you finish early, just say yield, and, and we'll go ahead and move on uh, to and move the remainder of your time somewhere else. I will ask the question. I'll call on you. It'll be in a random order to answer. While I am a libertarian, I have designed these questions to be challenging, and I've modeled these debates after the mainstream debates, not necessarily the uh, friendly libertarian formats that you might be used to that make you look good. My audience is tasked with evaluating the quality of your responses. I will be judging you based on how prepared you are for the challenges that I propose, how well you understand the questions that I set before you, and how well you manage your time, and how compelling your questions are to make all Americans, not just libertarians, vote for you. At the end, we'll have an open forum filled with audience questions, and then you'll have three minutes to issue a closing statement, which you may use to summarize your feelings on the environment, challenge an opponent's response to a question, and or address any issue that you didn't feel got brought up adequately during the debate. Candidates, here we go. Let's make this first question simple. Since you know it's all coming, do you believe in global warming? Why or why not? And we will start with Daniel. Taxation is theft. Berman. Hey, um, how's it going? Welcome. Taxation is theft. Um, global warming. So this is an interesting topic. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not the globe or uh, plane, if you prefer, is warming. Um, and then there's also another discussion that's whether or not it's our fault. And of course, these two cons these two um, uh, conversations are usually argued at the same time and people kind of go back and forth past each other. So um, there's really a lot of information to look at. Yeah, it's possible there is global warming. Um, it's possible that it is a real issue, but it's also possible that it's not our fault and something that's out of our control because the universe is kind of a pretty big thing. We don't have the power to change the tides. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, it's possible that with, you know, with enough pollution in the air, we could theoretically do that. Um, but historically we've also seen that, that the environment goes through all kinds of phases of, of changes and everything else. So, um, it's really difficult to say that it's our fault, especially we see, you know, they talk about, um, carbon dioxide emissions and how that correlates to, uh, heat trends. But at the same time, we see it usually trails behind the heat trends. So it actually gets hotter first and then we get carbon dioxide. Um, so at the same time, I don't want to say like, yeah, this, you know, we shouldn't have a clean environment. We should, um, you know, this is all, something we should all be concerned about. Something we should all want is to have a cleaner environment, but you know, whether or not that's an emergent cause that we need to deal with, whether or not we need to pass carbon taxes and do all these other things. And of course, give government more control, more power to try to fix this problem, I think is kind of the wrong direction. I think there are other ways that we can solve this problem. We can get clean air, clean water, and all these other things that we actually want, regardless of whether or not it affects the weather. All right, next up, Arvind Vora. Uh, thanks, Hody. I'm gonna actually disagree with Dan on a, on a couple things, which is, the first is I do believe that the environment, uh, the environmental situations we have right now, they are, emergent problems. And in terms of whether or not I believe in global warming, I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of science. Science is not about belief. It's not an article of faith. It is do what does the current evidence suggest? And as far as I understand, it's not so clear one way or the other. Do I think it's more than likely that global warming is true? Probably. But I think we really need to get this central idea, which is that global warming is not America warming. It is a worldwide phenomenon, and that requires worldwide solutions. If you consider, for example, your cell phone, your cell phone uses a low energy screen. And because it also has other conveniences, for example, you don't have to lug around a gigantic CRT, a CRT screen and a portable generator, people adopt it. Whether, even if the United States made a worldwide ban on those screens, people would use them anyway. When we try to subsidize individual technologies, green energy, et cetera, that's great for American crony capitalists because it makes sure that their stuff gets bought. 
but it doesn't actually address a global problem. The global problem is the worldwide adoption of a technology. And subsidies actually get in the way of that. They prevent those uh, technologies from being good enough to compete in the open market. It's essentially, in my opinion, a kind of affirmative action for green energy, which does what affirmative action always does, keeps things down, prevents excellence, prevents people from being able to fairly compete. And today it's preventing green technologies from actually competing. The green technologies that are left to the open market, they compete just fine. Right now, your cell phone screen, nobody uses a high power cell phone screen. That would be insane. But the reason that that works is because it was called in that crucible of the free market where it was actually able to compete, not to falsely compete. The solution is less government, less regulation, and no subsidies. All right. Max Abramoff, your turn. It's uh, Abramson. Abramson, I am so sorry. Yep. Uh, yes, I do believe that uh, climate change is going on. I do believe that there's a human contribution to it. Um, but I definitely don't agree with the secretly negotiated uh, treaties like the Paris deal or the Kyoto protocols. Um, all of the deals that I've seen or, or very high carbon tax. Sweden has $150 a ton carbon tax. That's effectively uh, more than twice the uh, level of taxation that we have on gasoline, diesel fuel and uh, heating fuels. Um, I think that the answer is to go back to old school libertarianism which is uh, we had a solution uh, discussed back in the 1990s uh, when I first got into the Libertarian Party, which was simply to remove all the artificial fees, taxes, regulations, red tape, even patent filing fees that get in the way of the development of new technology. So new alternative fuels, alternative energies, uh, alternative uh, engines, and uh, new uh, ride sharing options, private busing, private uh, carpooling, car private uh, van pulling services, all of those things would cut down on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I don't believe that CO2 is the major cause. We know that water vapor is about 10 times as potent as uh, CO2 is, as a greenhouse gas. Uh, we know that methane is about 25 times as potent, but we also know that the solar cycle is uh, producing more global heating and greater change than all of the human activity uh, that uh, we've done put together. Um, I think that the, the best solution is to get government out of the way as much as possible, the development of new technologies like solar, wind, geothermal, uh, and some of these other technologies so that we are developing new, better technology for the rest of the world. Um, I absolutely do not agree with the, the Paris deal, which would cost millions of jobs, potentially up to 2 million jobs in manufacturing and energy. I think that the effect of all of those, uh, uh, combined all of those environmental regulations would be to ship billions of tons of fossil fuels and millions of manufacturing jobs overseas. And it would only hurt America and hurt our ability to uh, make those advances. All right. Thank you, Max Abramson. And thank you for your forgiveness there. Uh, Be Benjamin Letter, you're the last one on this question. I think we all know that this is a scam or at least has been turned into one. Uh, you know, there are real issues as far as, you know, our responsibility uh, as, a, as a species on this planet to, uh, you know, leave it in a better condition than we, than we found it. You know, that's, that's, that's the ideal there. But what, what has become, I mean, y'all remember Al Gore, remember what killed his career? You know, he made that movie, An, in, An Inconvenient Truth, and then these other guys made this movie, An Inconsistent Truth, debunking his claims. You know, uh, we have corruption throughout the system. You know, we need to eliminate in the ability to participate in insider trading for, for Congress and, and any other government officials who uh, get the pass on insider trading because that's what they're doing and they're passing around these sweetheart deals and they're pumping this money uh, into the market and they're propping up uh, these markets that wouldn't otherwise necessarily be propped up if they weren't all completely uh, subsidized uh, and they're, they're doing it all, you know, at at the expense of all of our money because, you know, taxation is, is, is theft. Um, and <clears throat> yeah. Um, sorry, we can all see each other right now, but, um, that's what it is. It's a big theft scam. Um, you know, aside from our personal responsibilities to not, you know, litter and throw stuff out, like, you know, we have a, a, a campaign here in Texas, don't mess with Texas. And, you know, 
hey, don't mess with the rest of the world. Um, and it doesn't take government intervention, uh, subsidies, taxation, or anything to, to really accomplish that. Uh, should, should we be able to deal with big oil spills and things like that? Yeah, but we should have the, the militia and volunteer fire departments and more, more solutions like that than you know, big government contracts. All right. Thank you, Ben. Uh, regardless of your belief in global warming, would you as president do anything to stop industrial businesses from engaging in the deterioration of our atmosphere? And we will turn that to where we left from where we left off. Uh, back to you, Benjamin Letter. Oh, can you say that again? Um, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, regardless of your belief in global warming, would you as president do anything to stop industrial businesses from engaging in the deterioration of the Earth's atmosphere? If if there if there if there was industrial businesses that, that were ex, you know exploiting the, the the environment you know absolutely you know I, I would criticize that if 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 it was actually going on, um, the reality is is in today's culture that it really doesn't often take more than that um, you know the, the, a lot of the major changes you know in the last you know hundred years came from you know major boycotts uh, and people choosing to spend their money elsewhere, uh, they, you know, boycotting uh, things during the civil rights movement, you know, boycotting things. We see, a, a, you know, a cultural trend on social media where, you know, when uh, somebody who's in a position to, you know, of great social influence uh, says that, you know, they're no longer going to buy X because of Y, uh, people, people do that. It affects them. Businesses can, can go under, they, they learn. Um, in the end, no matter what the government says, the market decides. All right. Thank you so much. We'll move this along to Arvind Vora. Uh, Hody, this is actually going to surprise you, which is that, yes, if I knew that there was a large, gigantic organization that was polluting the earth more than anybody else, that was doing more damage than anybody else, I would put a stop to it. And I would actually use government to put a stop to it. Uh, specifically, I'm referring to the United States military, which is the biggest polluter on earth. As president, the first thing I would do is bring the troops home, shut down all foreign military bases, end involvement in all foreign wars. Listen, if people in backwards parts of the world want to fight each other with sticks and spears and stones, go ahead. It's not going to damage the environment. And they'll soon learn the lesson of what happens when you engage in backwards intolerance instead of civilized discourse. But I would bring all the troops home, I would end all involvement in all foreign wars of any kind. We would not be involved in other countries' civil wars. We would stop doing things like spraying Agent Orange all over the place, which I think most people on most sides of the environmental debate will agree uh, is something that damages in the environment. And I would shut that down. I would fire most people in the military. I would fire, or, or, or most all, all people currently in the military. I would shut down all of those operations. I would stop building planes and tanks that no one needs or wants. That's what's happening right now. There are massively expensive production, uh, both in terms of financial resources and environmental resources, metals, coal, all that stuff that goes into this level of production that's being basically wasted. I mean, we have things that the army itself doesn't want. And it's still being produced in order to fulfill goal, goals of crony capitalism. So, so in that sense, yes, I would absolutely be using a governmental measure, which is I would end all military involvement, bring the troops home, leave NATO and stop doing that. Uh, in terms of private organizations, uh, Ben is right. These are subtle, this, subtle issues and they're best handled through voluntary boycotts, etc. But when it comes to the biggest polluter on earth, it does more pollution than the next five uh, industrial organizations combined. It is the U.S. military, and I will stop that pollution right away. My jaw hit the floor, and then he surprised me in the most Arvin way possible. <laughs> Daniel Berman, you're up next. So I think, you know, that's that's a great question. And, you know, what what I would say kind of is the same thing as what Arvin would say, except on the the reality is, you know, a lot of people say, well, hey, there's pollution going on. We should have more government get involved. Um, of course, more government means more pollution. And in Arvin's example, that absolutely means more pollution because that's the government creating the pollution. What we see in industries that are not government is we actually see government protecting corporations from all the pollution that they do. Um, there was uh, when we had the oil spill in the in the Gulf um, uh 
uh, a couple of years ago, there was an agreement that that these oil companies had where as long as the U.S. government told them where they would drill, they would be limited to like, you know, some small amount. I think it was twenty five million dollars. So if they had an oil spill, they wouldn't have to spend more than that. And that was their protection. Of course, it didn't work out like that because of public outrage. But had people not gotten pissed off enough that that thing had actually gone down the way it did, those those companies would have gotten away with, you know, paying twenty five million dollars for the cleanup and letting the taxpayers pay for the rest. We also have to consider that, um, you know, there, there have been cases that went all the way to the Supreme Court where butchers were, were, you know, killing hundreds of thousands of animals every year and dumping the guts and blood and everything into the Mississippi River. That all travels downriver and that damages people's property. All you have is you have the government trying to protect these corporations when the reality is they're dumping uh, pollution on people's property is flowing down the river. It's landing on people's property. If it lands on your property, you have the right to sue for property damage that that company has done to you. And it is government, not these big evil corporations. It is government that gives them that protection so that you can't sue them. All right, Max Abramson, you go ahead and finish this off. Yes, uh, I would definitely uh, take action on uh, environmental issues. Uh, the only legitimate form of taxation, if any form of taxation is legitimate, is on ne uh, negative externalities, air pollution, water pollution, soil erosion, things that one person do does or that one group of people or company does that adversely affects others, that contributes to cancer clusters, brown fields, uh, gray fields. Uh, those types of pollution, if they uh, are contributing to illness, to sickness, to uh, releasing uh, carcinogens, teratogens, and other types of uh, uh, harmful chemicals or radiation, uh, those things are harmful. We're discussing that in the state legislature right now. Um, I did, also, I did um, as a kind of imperfect alternative, I voted as a, uh, on the floor of the House for increasing fines for uh, certain types of air and water pollution uh, to allow DES to go in and put a stop to uh, certain types of pollutants. Um, but there's no, there's no perfect solution. I think that the Baker-Schultz plan is a, a pretty good plan. It would replace about $300 plus billion dollars a year in regulatory compliance costs with roughly $200 billion in uh, uh, taxes on pollution, which would then be rebated back to the taxpayers um, again, it's not perfect, but it'd be vastly better than what we have right now. We have 23 college Republican groups. We have about 10 college Democrat groups, and we have a lot of uh, environmental and uh, even industrial groups that are in favor of the Baker-Schultz plan. I think it would be vastly better at, at tackling uh, pollution and greenhouse gas emissions because it would create incentives for companies to cut back on emissions. Um, I would also, of course, get back to constitutionally limited government. When you drastically downsize the federal government, you don't have as, as many federal employees driving around on the roads and highways, um, and you don't have as much uh, government activity going on. I would also bring the troops home uh, from overseas. It's the, the reason that I'm run, I decided to run for uh, president, to bring the troops home from overseas to get them out of harm's way and stop all these foreign wars. Right. Um, the U.S. government is the biggest polluter. All right, guys, thank you so much for your response on that question. <clears throat> Moving on, does the right to property include the right to the water on your property or the air on your property? If not, why not? If so, how do you presume businesses would be prosecuting for polluting or altering either one? And for that question, we will start, <clears throat> we will start with Benjamin Letter. You know, I, there, the issue of water rights is, is, is a good one because it is like the most important uh, aspect of, of survival. And, and I'm, I'm of the opinion that if, if you own the property that you should be able to drill a well uh, for, for water. That's a, that's a basic, that's a basic thing. Now, um, you know, in some States uh, there's been a separation of, of land, land rights or land ownership and mineral rights and, and mineral ownership. And that, I guess that, that might be, you know, a, a, a separate, a separate matter, uh, for, you know, communities to decide how they're going to operate, you know, in their state, what their state law is going to be on that. But I think that water is, uh, it's, it's a necessity of life. So I, I cannot, I could never blame a person, uh, or fine a person or tax a person uh, because they needed water uh, to live. 
Um, you know, if anything about the water we should be concerned about is with what some of these sweetheart deals like uh, Nestle uh, and some of the stuff that's going on uh, in and around the Great Lakes area. Uh, companies have been, you know, uh, polluting that, destroying that, and then, you know, uh, pumping it out and selling it off uh, internationally uh, and making an incredible amounts of money uh, doing that. Um, and, you know, if that seemed, that does seem um, like, how did, how did they get that? How did that come to be? I, I you know, I don't fully understand, um, you know, and maybe I should look a little bit more into it, but uh, there are, there are some strange things going on with water. It seems like a certain you know, groups have, have uh, more rights than, than others. Um, and I know here locally, you know, uh, there's a, who controls the, the, you know, the Tarrant County Water District, uh, these these water districts. Uh, okay. there's, a, there's a lot of corruption there and we should be running more libertarians, you know, in, in these areas and, and finding out what's going on and uh, correcting any corruption or in, injustices that, that, that may be going on in, in different places. Like, you know, Flint, Michigan is also yeah. a big national issue that people just seem to exploit for their own gains, you know, uh, yeah. but we never see, uh, we still haven't seen progress. All right, Max, your turn. Sorry, I had that on mute. Uh, my answer is yes, you do own the water that lands on your property. In fact, I believe a uh, strong believer in property rights um, that you own all the rainwater that lands on your property. There are companies like Nestle that are actually uh, using their political influence to uh, enter into other countries and use their political clout to essentially steal the right to the rainwater. So all the locals in, in some of these Latin American countries are now losing access to their own rainwater that they used to collect. Um, you absolutely own you own that water. Uh, you own all the resource. You own the land and everything underneath it. And you own um, by uh, American law, you own a, a large part of the airspace over your land. Uh, that belongs to you. Nobody else has the right to enter your airspace. Um, uh, another reason that John Locke advocated for private ownership of land is that he believed that the, uh, the land belonged to you, uh, not as a, a personal property, like a, a personal artifact, like a toothbrush or a comb, that it belonged that God created the land and he gave it to the people and the people have a responsibility then to manage the land uh, properly. Um, he believed that it was our responsibility to take, take care of the land. And what we've seen from uh, experience over the years is um, that we, the people have uh, managed the land better, that the, the worst mismanaged lands are uh, on federal lands uh, the vast majority of Superfund sites are on federal lands. Um, some of the worst uh, water pollution that's occurred has occurred because of EPA spills. Um, one of the worst uh, toxic environments is at an EPA testing facility. Um, and if land and water are privately owned and fishing rights are privately owned like they are in uh, Britain, uh, where private wardens okay. and private property owners own uh, rights to the fish that, that uh, they protect the fish stock and they do a much better job of protecting that than uh, federal agencies do. All right, Arvin, let's have your take on this one. When we look at what land ownership does, I think a great analogy is to look at what happened with poachers in Africa. When, when, the, when, when people in villages and, and, and towns were given the right to own elephants, they stopped poaching the elephants they started trying to invest in the elephant herds and that private ownership over the elephants increased the health, the number, and every possible benefit to the elephants as well as economically to the people. We see the same thing in America. When people own land, they find ways to protect it. I mean, when they really own it. As a simple example, when the Ottoman Bond Society wanted to have, uh, was asked if they could have, if, if, was asked to have drilling on their land, they agreed under a very strict set of criteria. And because they knew what they were doing, they made sure it was done safely with minimal damage to their land because it was their land, not somebody else's. And it was done safely and responsibly. On the other hand, when government gave land that no one really owns to have somebody else drill, the result was the BP disastrous oil spill. Private ownership is the solution and private ownership needs to extend deeply. I believe that private ownership over land should be moved as quickly as possible to full sovereignty rights. 
I believe that we should be able to buy parts of land and those lands we should be able to set laws and taxes and run them as our own countries. And if you want to look at a real example of this and how well it works, look at Hong Kong. It enjoys a little bit more freedom and a lot more innovation. And today in Hong Kong, which is, you know, was not fully sovereign, but kind of semi-sovereign, today, you know what their number one source of pollution is? Pollution coming over from mainland China via the air. That is the effect of letting people totally and completely own their land. Hong Kong only got 90% full sovereignty, and yet that's how different they were. I believe that if we have full sovereignty over our land, complete sovereignty, we're going to see much lower pollution because right. people will care for their, their now countries far more deeply than they ever would for just property rights. All right. Closing thoughts on this from Daniel Berman. So I want to talk about property rights as it you know, how we got to where we are today. Because a long time ago, you had kings who basically owned everything and they would put people to work on their land to grow their food and, and all these other things as slaves. Then they were like, okay, well, the slaves aren't that happy. Let's turn them into serfs we'll, where we'll let, them, we'll let them pretend like they're owning the land, but they're really just renting it. Um, and they can take a little bit of benefit from that land, but it's really ours. Um, and when you look at that system, it's it's less like slavery, but it's still not owning the land. And if you think about it, that's really kind of the system we have in the U.S. today. Nobody owns land. I and mean, we can talk about air rights and mineral rights and everything else. Nobody owns land because every single day you have to pay rent to the government just to stay there. And if you don't pay that rent, they will kick you off that land. It's theirs. Um, and this is how they force us into a system of of slavery. I mean, literally, you can live on land. You can live off of the earth without having to work, you don't need a job. But when they come along and say, well, you need to give us money in order to stay on this land, in order to survive, well, now you're forced to go into town and get a regular job to earn these coins or paper bills so that you can pay the tax man so you can not get kicked off the land and not starve to death. This is like, it's, it's a convoluted system that they're forcing us to pay into. They're forcing us to work jobs. And then they go and they brag about um, unemployment rates going down because they're forcing us to work in factories and all this other shit. That's, th this is like, if we had real property rights, this wouldn't be an issue. Um, yes, you can have water. We can talk about how, like, you know, if the water's on your land, like, do you get to own adjacent land to your property just because it's touching? Probably not, but you can say, okay, but I own part of the land where the water is. And now you have rights to that water. Why? Not because it's next to your property, but because you're using that property the same way you get property rights for using uh, different land. So we can look at it a lot that way, but ultimately we have to go back and say, look, if somebody owns land, they should own the land. They shouldn't have to rent it for the rest of eternity from their government. That is just an evil, evil system of, of convoluted um, uh, slavery. All right, candidates, thank you so much for your thoughts on that. We're moving on to the next question. Before the EPA, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire due to the sheer amount of pollution. Before the expansion of the EPA, water companies poisoned thousands and gave hundreds of people cancer in California. Under any reform your administration would bring, how would you prevent such disasters? Because you will be held accountable for it, whether you feel that you should be or not. And we'll start one more time with Benjamin Letter. Sorry, Ben, are you still there? You might be muted. There you are. Okay, there I am. <clears throat> Those things are still happening now. I mean, the EPA might exist, but Flint, look at what's happening in Flint. What's the EPA doing for Flint? Flint's, I think, you know, Flint's getting turned into a typical, you know, uh, scam. Um, the the money that people dumped into this um and it's still happening um there's 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 bad water all over the place what's the epa doing about that do you see epa trucks driving around you know checking creeks and stuff I, i've never seen the epa in my day-to-day -day life once um i don't know what they're doing with the money um probably working backroom deals but is, is the water, I, I can't be convinced that the, that the water quality is better, you know, because of the EPA. I, we still see the same stuff happening. Um, I think that, uh, you know, communities need to be empowered and, and that's where the solution is. Um, and by people 
folks in their own communities getting involved in these these water districts, getting involved in their local city councils and their local county governments and taking back their communities from, you know, uh, any any corrupt crony capitalist influence or, or things like that uh, is probably the way to go. Um, I don't I don't know. Uh, what what can happen on the the federal level because there there's an EPA we still have water pollution and you know uh, it, this doesn't seem to be doing anything I think we need to be handling this in our own backyards you know I live here on the lake on the water I consider it a huge responsibility because this is the water supply for Tarrant County so I don't I don't spill any oil I don't do any of that kind of stuff because you know I know what's at stake here and I think that it's a it's an issue that we need to you know you you know ch shift culturally through education and just, you know, looking at reality. Time. This is our environment and we, we need to take care of it. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Daniel Berman. Man. Um, yeah. I'm going to have to agree with Ben. Uh, the EPA is just a scam um, there. You know, what was it? The EPA dumped like all this uh, toxic water into, into a few rivers um, over the past couple of years. Um, you know, we've seen them do terrible things. Um, and you know, it's, and then, you know, we see the regulatory power of it too, where, where, uh, there was a, uh, there was a milk farm who spilled milk on their, on their own farm and they were left to clean it up. But the EPA came in and said, oh, well, there's oil in the milk. So we're going to treat it like an oil spill. Um, I, I might be, I might be paraphrasing that whole story a little bit, but, um, like that's, that's the power of the EPA. They go to people and they say, oh, you have, you have land and it's got a trashy swamp on it and you want to kind of clear up the land and, and make it nicer, maybe more habitable for, for other animals or, or, you know, whatever you want to do with it, make it nicer. And the EPA says, no, sorry, you can't do that. It's a scam. There, there are tragedies that are going to happen. There are, there are things that are going to spill. Um, that's the reality. And the people who spill it should be held accountable and, and they should be, you know, that, that threat of having to clean up their own mess should be enough to make them be more cautious in the future. Um, but you know, when the government comes in and, you know, this is the thing, everybody says, Hey, somebody, something happened. Somebody should do something about it. The government will come in and they'll say, Oh, we did something. Let's take credit for it. When the reality is no, everybody else learned from it and they're going to be more careful now. And the government's going to go and take credit for it. And at the same time, people are like, oh, well, we paid our taxes. The government should do something about it instead of, oh, my God, this is something I believe in. I should do something about it. You just delegate that power because you already gave all this money to government knowing that they took all your money and they're not going to do anything about it. Um, because, in fact, the people who created the problem are probably giving even more money to the government so that they can be protected and not have to do anything about it. So, you know, we hear all the time like, oh, yeah, things are getting better. Maybe they're just maybe the news is just managing it better. Like maybe maybe things are actually getting worse and we're not hearing about it because now it's all controlled by the government. We don't hear about it. You know, the media is controlled and that's that's the government sucks. Good closing statement there. Uh, Max Abramson, your turn. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the EPA's uh, accidental spillage at the Gold King mine triggered one point two billion dollars in uh, uh, lawsuits against the agency. And the EPA just said, well, you know. We're just not going to pay it. They have government agencies and government officials have something called sovereign immunity. So they can uh, do all kinds of uh, damage um, to uh, to the public, to our waterways, to our environment, and they get away with it. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, our socialist friends say that uh, more government takeover will uh, result in uh, better protection. But if you look at the most socialist country ever, the Soviet Union, um, the, the country was full of environmental disasters, not just Chernobyl, but uh, you couldn't run in some cities. You couldn't go out for a jog in some cities because you would get sick from all of the pollution. Uh, the EPA, one of the worst uh, environmental disasters in the country is uh, the EPA's own uh, testing facilities where they've dumped so many different chemicals into the, in, into the water, just carelessly disposing of them because they have sovereign immunity, because they're exempt from, uh, from their own... Uh, uh, rules and regulations. Um, in 2016, total federal environmental regulations reached a staggering, or total federal regulations reached a staggering 185,000 pages of regulations, 185,000 pages. And one of the most difficult tasks that uh, shop owners and business owners face is uh, just trying to figure out which regulations apply to them. And the total cost is uh, about 10% of our total economic output, just trying to comply with all the different regulations. So I, I don't believe that the, that 
a big top heavy federal government is the answer. I don't believe that socialism is the answer. Um, in fact, there's a poll of uh, professional economists over 90% said that, that they would much prefer uh, Milton Friedman's proposal of taxing air and water pollution to more and more regulations, more and more red tape, more and more arbitrary permits where the politically well-connected get permits to do whatever they want, but at the same time, they get to block uh, competitors like uh, the infamous uh, uh, red tree uh, uh, case in Northern California where uh, friends of Bill, the Bill Clinton uh, contributors, were able to cut down as many redwood trees as they wanted and no one else was allowed to, so they were able to charge three times as much for redwood. All right, and closing statements on this question from Arvind Vora. Cody, the issue with the Cuyahoga River is the same issue that, that ails so many environmental issues, which is that no person owns the river. You're dealing with the classic problem of the commons, and the solution to the problem of the commons is to not have any commons, to only have private property. Imagine this. Imagine that you walked into a restaurant into a shopping mall, into somebody's house, and started dumping chemicals, they would stop you. They would find some way to stop you. They would have security do it, or they would do it themselves. I can guarantee you that in any mall, in any restaurant, in any house in the whole world, if you start dumping chemicals, someone's going to stop you. But if it's not owned by you, if it's a land that's not owned by anybody at all, of course people are going to dump into it because no one's there to stop them. No one's there to say, this is my land. Stop dumping nonsense into it. And you see this not just in rivers, you see this everywhere. It's not that environmentalism is bad, environmentalism is good, but having the government mismanage it is terrible. And with government schools, again, problem of the commons, because people feel that here's this just general public thing to dump stuff into, no one gives it the respect that you normally see in any kind of private education, in any kind of homeschooling, any kind of education that actually matters. Again, it's the problem of the commons. You see that even with roads. Today, we look back at the Soviet Union and make fun of them for having to stand in bread lines for five hours a day while we sit in traffic for five hours a day doing the exact same thing. When you have commons, when you have government-run land or government-run waterways or government-run roads, you end up with the same problem, which is incorrect use, overuse, insufficient maintenance, and insufficient care. And the solution that has always worked every time without any exception has been private, complete, total private ownership. Because if somebody owned that river, I guarantee you this, they would not have let it get to that level of pollution or anywhere near it. Private property is the solution to environmental damage. Great. Thank you so much for your thoughts on that, candidates. Uh, here's another catastrophe to talk about. After the catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico, which we're still recovering from, people are rightfully wary of where and how we drill for oil. Much of the alternative to drilling the oil for here, though, is that we must buy from terrorist-friendly countries overseas if we don't drill here. Is there any resolution to this dilemma under your leadership? And we will start with Max Abramson. For the uh, uh, dependency on foreign oil, I would... Uh, fall back on my previous answer that we need to remove all the obstacles to the development of uh, alternative fuels, alternative energies, and uh, alternative engines that are more efficient and uh, vehicles that are light, more lightweight, more efficient. Um, I also believe that uh, we need to uh, open up the uh, country for energy exploration. There's a poll out that shows that something like 80% of Americans support energy exploration. Um, and people often ask the question, well, how do you prevent them from, from polluting if you don't have regulations telling you how big uh, each valve has to be? And the Coast Guard gets really uh, uh, intricate in some of their regulations. I worked, used to work as a merchant mariner, and they tell you how to pack a valve. They get, they get so uh, overbearing that they're telling workers how to handle each tiny minor task on a merchant ship. Um, but the solution is already there. These uh, shipping companies and energy companies already buy insurance and the uh, insurance companies already have private companies like ABS that come in and, and perform inspections. And the standards that the, the private companies have are much higher than uh, federal agencies. And there's less uh, cronyism and there's less uh, potential for uh, abuse. The U.S. Coast Guard, when they'd come on a vessel, uh, they would mandate... Uh, uh, devices that uh, were less safe than last year's life jackets, uh, little flashlights uh, on your life jackets, $28 flashlights that are designed to fail. 
And it turns out that a lot of those devices uh, were, the patents were owned by current and retired uh, Coast Guard regulators. Um, so there's a lot of cronyism and uh, skimming off the top going on. Um, just having private agencies doing it, the, the, I think that the federal government's role should be limited to just requiring that these companies have a sufficient amount of insurance to cover any potential uh, uh, oil spill or uh, pollution and that the, the private sector already has solutions at work um, that uh, prevent the worst disasters. It, it, the worst disasters that have happened have happened because of government uh, over, uh, oversights. Right. All right, let's uh, move it along to Arvind Vora. This is the same issue that, we're see that we saw before, which is that when you don't have some clear person owning land, you're going to have more pollution. We already mentioned how in the Audubon Society, on their land, they made sure the drilling was done right. When the government had it on public land, the solution was that you got the BP oil disaster. That's what happens with public ownership of land. That's what happens with the commons. The commons should not exist. All land should be privately held. It should be sovereign land, and it should be you should have the same control over that land as you would over a country. The right to set laws and taxes and whatever you want. Because if it is your land, really your land, you'll do whatever is necessary to make sure it's safe. If you need to make money off of it, you'll do it in the way that's not going to destroy your actual personal asset. But if it's a public asset, who cares? And that's the exact behavior that we've seen. If you look at the places that have the worst pollution, they also have the biggest government. The, the air in China today is borderline unbreathable. And it's not because China doesn't have a big enough or oppressive enough government. The air in America is cleaner, not because of our government, government, but because of our innovations. And we can take that farther by letting there be more innovation. More innovation will come from private, sovereign ownership of land, letting people explore oil however they want to. But I did want to address something else that you said, which is the idea that many of these are terrorist-friendly countries. Terrorism is a problem, as one that's been created by American foreign policy. And one way to shut down environmental damage is to shut down foreign military bases and bring the troops home. But it's also a good way to shut down terrorism. Terrorists are not mad at the United States for no reason. They are mad at the United States for invading their countries, setting up military bases, setting up invasive checkpoints. Trust me, as much as you hate getting a traffic ticket, people in foreign countries hate being questioned and attacked and killed by U.S. troops much, much, much more. So if we want to stop creating those terrorist-friendly countries, as you put it, we need to shut down all foreign involvement in civil wars, bring the troops home, and stop treating other nations with violence. All right. Daniel Berman, what do you think? Yeah, I think everyone's got some uh, some great thoughts so far. Um, you know, we do have the government preventing other people from uh, creating new, um, innovative, um, safer technology uh, for energy. Um, there's plenty of oil here at home. Um, there's plenty of oil in Mexico. If we ended the drug war, uh, we could trade with them. Um, at the same time, we want to get off of oil because, you know, we're talking about the environment, you know, throwing more oil up and, you know, turning it into carbon, um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, throwing it up in the air, um, you know, to, to, so that we're living in this big brown dirt of just nastiness is not a good idea. That's something we should get away from. So, so, you know, while we are dependent on oil at this time, we should get the government out of regulating where we get it from and, and stop trying to, to say that it has ownership of it. Because remember, the government claims ownership of, uh, ownership of it. They kind of create false scarcity. They jack the prices up. And then, of course, they, they put $180 million per day in tax on it. Um, it's, it's insane. Get government out of that. Uh, we've got plenty of oil here. We've got plenty of oil with our neighbors and we should stop subsidizing it so that we can actually start to stop su subsidizing it. The prices will go up, but get the taxes out. It'll go way back down even further. Um, and then we can start seeing how other uh, other energy alternatives are actually much, much cheaper. All right. Thank you so much. Closing thoughts on this question from Benjamin Letter. Ben, you might still be muted, my friend. Oil remediation. There we go. Um, I guess that's that's what we're talking about, right? Cleaning cleaning it up. Um, who cleans it up now? I mean, are, are, is there a, is there a, a branch of government that's the the oil remediator branch of government? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I'm pretty sure this gets handled by uh, companies that get subcontracted, and there's a lot of sweetheart deals on who has these kind of standby contracts in the case if you know something goes down 
Um, that's how I understand that a lot of it works. Um, I don't know uh, what the best way to facilitate um, oil remediation would necessarily be uh, across the globe, because it sounds like we're, we're talking about that too. Um, but I, I know that um, we should experiment. We should not be just suckered into what we know deep down are, are crony capitalist uh, deals where they're, they're sucking up tax money, putting it out into contracts, fluffing up insurance markets, um, bailing people out. Um, it shouldn't, it, 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 we, should, we should have room to experiment. And as far as the US military is concerned and you know, all of our network of bases across the world, you know, perhaps we could, you know, in the process of toning back, repurpose uh, some of these bases and some of this equipment that they happen to have. I know during Hurricane Harvey, the equipment that the US military had was a huge asset. They were there, they had C-130s, they were flying people out. Um, the, this is a, a group of people that can perform a, a lot of roles and maybe we can see some things happen there. All right. Thanks so much, Candidates. Moving on to the next question here. The government, oddly, engages in both suppression and encouragement of alternative energy, from mandating ethanol to requiring licenses for solar, solar panels. It's hard to pin down where politicians actually want us to explore in terms of energy. Give the audience a picture of what alternative energy might look like thanks to your presidency, especially with things being so murky right now. And let's start with Daniel Berman. So, you know, um, maybe five years ago, um, I was looking into building solar on my own home and looking at the, the cost analysis of, um, you know, what it would cost to install it versus what it would actually give me in electricity or save me um, in my electric bill. Um, it was actually really interesting to see. Now, of course, um, the electric company is subsidized. So, you know, what are the actual prices? We don't know. Um, there's government involved in those lines. There's, there's taxes on top of it. And of course, they can't tax the electricity uh, if you have solar cells. Um, over a long enough period of time, that's going to pay off. It's going to be cheaper. Um, but they don't want you to do that. I've, uh, I've seen instances of people who completely disconnected their homes from the, from the power grid and installed solar, and the government started fining them and said, no, you got to connect back to the grid. Why is that? That makes absolutely no sense. If you want to ask who the government really works for, follow the money. Why are they forcing you to connect your home to an electric grid when, for all intents and purposes, you could go out and live out in the middle of nowhere where there is no electric grid, and then what are they going to say? Nothing, right? Well, they'll probably kick you off the land and say it's theirs, but that's another story. Um, so, you know, we have all these energy alternatives. Um, there are so many different ways to get energy. Um, you know, if you live by a river, um, there, there are turbines you can stick in the, in the water that'll generate electricity. We consume so much electricity when, uh, you know, uh, switching to LED lights, uh, you know, these sorts of things, uh, uh, more efficient appliances, these all save electricity. So we actually need to generate less, which means, you know, all these turbines that we can get um, you know, they're, they're, they become less expensive. So there are all kinds of different ways. And really all we need to do is get government out of it. We'll see the prices go down. We'll see, we'll see the reality of more cost effective solutions. Um, and things will just naturally transition into the safer, cleaner environment for energy. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. Let's, uh, pass that question on to Arvind Vora. The, idea that government is able to intelligently pick what energy to use is absurd. What we actually see is crony capitalism at the highest level. For example, today we've noticed that most oil companies and gas companies are bizarrely underinvesting in biodiesel. It's something that would make logical sense. It would make economic sense and their investment isn't going there. And the reason for that is simple. The US military has troops all around all oil reserves in the Middle East to make sure that American companies can get at that oil. We put up puppet governments, for example, the theocratic sociopaths in Saudi Arabia, to make sure that they're going to be favorable enough to us so that we can get oil out of there so that American companies can benefit in a sense. I mean, I don't think there's a benefit to not innovating. I think it's a long run of loss, but it's a short-term benefit. What can we do? We can stop those subsidies. 
if all of a sudden all that Middle Eastern oil was, you didn't know if you were going to be able to get it next year or not, I guarantee you that the work on biodiesel would massively accelerate. At the end, whether you're getting biodiesel or crude or whatever to a refinery, that's an engineering question. And it's a financial and investment question that comes down to where people can actually put their money. Dan's right. The idea that they're, that people are so they're trying to stop us from going totally off grid clearly shows that this is much more about control and crony capitalism and not so much about environmentalism. Under my administration, the principles would be simple. No benefits, no subsidies for anybody. There'd be no more oil subsidies, no solar subsidies, no subsidies for electric companies of any kind. And if you wanted to live totally off grid, by all means, because once again, there'll also be no taxes, so I wouldn't have to worry about trying to, to catch you or anything like that. The key here is this. The free market is the best thing at producing low-cost energy, not because of anything special about energy, but because the free market is the best at producing low-cost everything. It produced low-cost computers and other wonders of technology, and it will do that for energy as well. All right. Thank you, Arvin. And uh, we will take that question over to Benjamin Letter. I mentioned it earlier, but insider trading is at the core of uh, a lot of the, pro the problems here. Um, people have financial interests and they want to protect them. And when you allow Congress to participate in insider trading, uh, and they're going to they give them carte blanche, they're going to that's what they're going to do. And that's 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 why we see, you know, on the national stage in the news, all of this spectacle going on between the Democrats and Republicans, because they're just they're just playing out this this typical scam um, when really what's going on behind the scenes is, you know, which companies are, are going to benefit from the outcomes of these decisions that are being made by these representatives who all have their hand in the pie from everything from uh, uh, private prison uh, corporations that are that are traded on uh, the stock uh, in new york stock exchange uh to every every one of these little, little single companies um and you know that what this does with this system of taxation and what they have set up is the ability to choose winners and losers and know in advance and be whispering that around and, and placing their bets in the market uh, and, 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 and manipulating the market. That's, that's what this is all about. That's why they're all so corrupt. That's why, you know, we see all this stuff going on. It's going to keep going on as long as we allow it to. All right. And the closing statements on this question from Max Abramson. Thorium reactors. Uh, there's actually a Libertarian caucus uh, just for thorium react reactors. And when we um, go online, there, there, there's growing interest in it. It's relatively, it's, it's safer than all the others. It's non-polluting. Um, it doesn't lead to meltdowns and problems like uh, old uh, fission reactors used to back in the days. But we actually have, uh, uh, I have a nuclear power plant in my backyard in Seabrook, Seabrook Station. It's one of the largest uh, reactors in the in the world as a matter of fact um, but there's a way to build uh, nuclear reactors to recycle spent nuclear fuel um, they can be made much safer they can be made uh, meltdown resistant um, but I think that the, the main solution is of course get government out of the way stop the crony capitalism stop projects like Solyndra um, which uh, of course was uh, one of many fiascos when you get government involved um, we've long understood that government interference in the economy is almost always driven by special interest groups, by big money groups that want to get in and interfere in the marketplace to, to block competition and force people to buy their, their products and their energy. And the oil companies are, are, are just as guilty as any other uh, uh, private outfit. Um, in fact, as a legislator, we, have, uh, we literally have lobbyists coming in every single day uh, making some far-flung excuse for blocking competition in the marketplace. So I think that the, uh, they're doing it for their own interests, and we frequently catch them uh, pushing their own interests, and, they, and they're using very weak arguments or ridiculous arguments to push for crony capitalism. So I think it's get government out of the marketplace, uh, let the marketplace work, um, and again, remove all the artificial obstacles, the red tape, the regulations, the taxes, the patent filing fees, uh, state licensing, all of the uh, artificial obstacles for the development of 
sustainable energies and renewable fuels, um, alternative energies. And uh, uh, I, I think that the, the marketplace has already shown that it works. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next question. Fracking has turned the United States from a next oil, net oil importer to a net oil exporter over the last few years. The cost, though, is it requires tremendous amounts of water, adds carcinogens to the soil, and paradoxically can poison nearby water wells. Is this result worth the cost? And if you're not the one paying that cost, why should we trust you to make those decisions? And uh, we're going to send that a quick turnaround here back to you, Max. Oh, good gravy, fracking. Well, I don't support fracking, but it's not a decision for legislators, and I don't think that's a decision directly to be made by uh, the president. Um, individuals and companies have the right to operate the way they choose so long as they're not harming anyone else. You have the right to reasonable use of your own land and the right to be free from unreasonable use by others. Um, and what we've seen initially from fracking is that a lot of chemicals were being dumped at the wellhead and it wasn't the chemicals going down into the earth. Um, it was the chemicals being uh, dropped on the surface. And we haven't yet seen proof uh, from the oil companies and from uh, uh, companies that uh, carry out fracking work yet that they, that they can uh, do this with uh, surety and safety. Um, again, I would say require that uh, all energy exploration and handling of chemicals and hazardous materials uh, require that they be fully insured, bonded, and, and uh, uh, secured post uh, securities. We already do that. I'm also a member of, uh, I'm not just a state legislator, I'm also a member of my town's planning board. So we already do a lot of this stuff. I don't think that, that there's a need for a big, top heavy uh, uh, federal government getting involved. I don't think that we need to have the federal government making day to day decisions for these companies. I think that the, uh, the, the private sector already has uh, solutions in place. That, uh, that, that prevent a lot of the damage. Um, and I, I would say no to fracking until they can prove that they can do it uh, safely and effectively. But uh, I, I'm sure that at some point in the future, they'll have, they'll have worked all those problems out. Okay, thank you, Max. Uh, next in line, let's take that question to Daniel Berman. So, um... I want to agree with Max on a lot of that. Um, you know, the, that that we shouldn't get the government into that business of, of deciding that. Um, you know, if if this is creating pollutants to nearby water wells, people who own this property, and if we respect property rights, and if we get government and special interests out of this, what you're going to see is you're going to see people, and you see this all the time. People are really upset about their waters being contaminated. Um, but they can't do anything about it because the government gives special protections to these companies. If these people are able to sue over property rights, over damaged water supplies, over, over um, uh, you know, any kind of pollutants getting into the soil where, they're, where, they're, where they have crops, if they're able to sue these companies, these companies are going to get smart and they're going to either figure out that they need to stop fracking or they're going to figure out some way that they can do it without spreading these contaminants. And that's ultimately what we want. Or they might say, hey, you know what? This is getting too expensive to clean up and, and frack and do all this. Let's switch to a different type of energy that's actually, if we take into account the cost of, of all the damage that we're doing to the environment, it's better to invest in solar. And then you're going to push these other companies to invest in, in cleaner energies. That's what we're going to see. That we're allowing these companies to get away with investing um, in, in things with, without the expense of cleaning up after themselves. And that's, that's where we're losing in, in this war with these companies that are just destroying the planet. All right. Thank you so much for those comments. We will now go to Arvin Vora. I think this is yet another example where we see the power of what sovereignty could do to handle some of these big problems. Environmental problems, these are big problems. They're complex problems. And small, minor, milquetoast solutions are not going to fix them. Imagine this. Imagine the United States, just the federal government sold off all federal lands, including the sovereignty rights. And so now instead of 50 states, the, the, the land that's currently the United States was about 5,000 private countries. Some of them probably owned bio oil companies. Would somebody with, that, with a private country with that much invested, with something where they could really control everything on their own land, would they be okay with somebody else fracking on there? I doubt it. I wouldn't. 
I would in a million years. And I don't think that Exxon would in a million years. And I don't think that any other oil company in a million years would ever allow that. The reason that it's happening right now is because the land is being leased from the government. It's not their land. They're not long-term invested in it. They don't have sovereignty rights over it by any stretch of the imagination. Sovereignty cures environmental problems. We've seen it work. We've seen the difference in the pollution rates between Hong Kong and China, where Hong Kong with a tiny little bit more sovereignty has gotten such little pollution comparatively compared to China, even though it's so densely populated, that the number one source of pollution in Hong Kong is pollution blowing over from China. That's their number one source of pollution. And we can have low pollution in America and we can figure out safer ways to do uh, hydraulic fracturing if there is somebody who's really invested. If there's somebody who really owns the land in the sovereignty sense, not just as leasing the land or being forced to rent it from the government, as Dan Berman said earlier. The solution to any kind of environmental problem has already been demonstrated. The Audubon Society, when drilling happened on their land, it was done safely because the Audubon Society owns and cares about the land. And we can do the exact same thing with all other lands if we end public land and make right. sure it's purely sovereign land where people own all rights to that land. All right, Ben, why don't you bring us home? Um, yeah. Earlier, I, I mentioned the, the, the separation of, uh, of property rights and, and mineral rights and, and these things. And as I understand it, that, that varies from, from state to state. Um, so it would, it would seem to me that a, a lot of these problems, as far as for different people in different communities that want to do things different ways, uh, is really going to take place within a lot of state legislatures on how they treat sovereignty. Because, you know, we, we've talked about sovereignty, but, you know, uh, if you if it's really sovereign, you know, do you do you have the right to sell your mineral rights? Do you have the right to lease them out? Um, you know, do communities have the right to decide how they want to uh, to group themselves together and and do things in, in their communities? And. I think a lot of this is is, is really going to get resolved on on that level. You know, what is going on in your community uh, is what what matters most, um, and those are the people that are most invested in in that area. Involving the federal government is just in, like I said earlier; it's involving a bunch of insider traders, and that's going to be whatever whatever outcome comes out of that, as it is right now. That's going to be what the mo the main motivator is. Um, not what's you know best for your community. People need to band together, take over their local governments, and do what needs to be done to secure their communities. All right, thank you so much for your thoughts there, guys. Let's switch uh, let's switch focus a little bit. We still got four more questions about the environment. Uh, we will be taking some audience questions after these four are asked. We do have one from uh, our old buddy William Hurst that I'll get to, but if you're listening and you want to hear one of your questions asked on Facebook Live, please let us know now. Until then, let's progress. I'm already looking forward to your answers to this one. Uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline made waves because it affected an entire community. However, on a nearly daily basis, the government uses eminent domain rights in order to, to make energy gathering and distribution all over the country. Without this practice, it's widely accepted that entire counties and even states might find themselves without large swaths of power due to one or two people refusing to give up their land for any price. How would you resolve this difficulty and what would your presidential policy be when it comes to this? And we'll start where we left off once again, Benjamin Letter. You know, the, the thought of the, the federal government uh, involving themselves in, in eminent domain may have seemed like a you know a, a reasonable thing in uh when the, when the, the constitution was was written and and you know some of these powers were, were granted um but it has it has been abused um this this was something that was you know for like emergency purposes only like in in the event that uh we had to defend our northern border from a canadian invasion and yeah that was like a, a more of a real thing at the time you know um you know we're gonna put a base here and it's in the it's in everybody's best interest that we do that not you know we're gonna you know we're gonna take over your front yard and we have easements and 
you know, all, all of this infrastructure is, is built on our properties. Um, and none of us are compensated. I'm not compensated for the telephone pole in my yard. Uh, I don't get a cut of the, uh, you know, what the action of what happens through the wires and neither did any of you guys. So I, I think in a lot of ways, you know, we've been kind of bamboozled uh, through, through eminent domain. And a lot of people are making a lot of money uh, and we're just forking it over every month in, in every way possible. Um, and it's going to be up to communities to band together and decide that, hey, you know what, we want to try something different here. Because um, trying to make the whole country do something on the federal level, it just ends up turning into constant infighting in, in the halls of Congress, and it ends in insider trading deals, and they don't really care because they're all doing just fine. All right, Daniel Berman, do you think differently? Daniel, you might still be muted, my friend. I, I am. Can you repeat that question one time for me? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline made waves because it affected an entire community. However, on a nearly daily basis, the government uses eminent domain rights in order to make energy gathering and distribution all over the country. Without this practice, it's widely accepted that countries, or I'm sorry, entire counties and even states might find themselves without large swaths of power. Uh, due to one or two people holding out and refusing to sell their land for any price. How would you resolve this dif difficulty and what would your presidential policy be on this? Right. So there's there's a lot buried into that question. Um, so I'll, I'll try to answer a few a few different parts of it. Um, you know, the, the government just likes to assume that any property is is theirs. Um, if we have a treaty with you, sorry, I hate using the word we, if the government has a treaty with you that says, yeah, you can have that land, they can decide, oh, well, you know what? We, we, yeah, we want it. Uh, the treaty's null and void. Um, if you have land and you've been living on that land with your family for, for centuries or um, generations, well, uh, that land is not filed in the government office. So it's not anybody's. It belongs to the government. Um, this is what they do. They'll, they'll figure out any excuse. And really, there's some usually some special interest behind it. Um, we look at the, the Dakota pipeline and it's, you know, it's, it's really the same kind of thing. If there are people on this land and from what I understand, there were a lot of disputes going on as to who was actually on the land where they were putting the pipelines and who was just near it and, and all these other things that never, you know, that never went to a fair trial of, you know, hey, let's actually work this out. It was just kind of like, no, there was a standoff. There were people saying, no, it's ours. And, you know, I, it's, it's, it's insane. It's a, it's a, it's a fight of who's got the most people, who's got the most guns and, and it's insane. That's not how it should be. We should look at, okay, who's been on this land, who's been using this land. Um, we should use some rational sense for that. Now, if somebody is going to say, I own all of this land, I own a hundred million acres and, and I'm just going to hold out so that you can't build something here. Then you get into the same problem of that's exactly what the government does. I mean, the government owns like what 70% of the Western half of the United States, um, how do you own land that that that's that big? How do you claim title to that much land? That doesn't make any sense. And that goes back to like, you know, when you talk about how do you acquire land from from its source of origin, um, you have to improve it in some way. And, and, you know, we can get into a philosophical debate about, you know, how how that's done. But for somebody to say, I own a million acres and you can't touch any of it, I've never set foot on 99 percent of it but it's mine is is, is an insane concept. So I, I don't think that's a realistic proposition. All right, Arvind Vore, your thoughts. Uh, Hody, I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, which is, what the heck are you talking about? I mean, when I think of the things that, that people need, I think of electricity, fiber optic cabling, satellites, natural gas under pressure, water under pressure, and all of these things are able to move at a 90 degree angle. So the idea that somebody could simply blockade that is... It's a science that is either wrong or so far outside of my understanding that I don't that I'm not really able to respond to the question. But if we are talking about the normal utilities that can actually go at a 90 degree angle, what you're describing is simply scientifically not possible. There is no such thing as that. It might cost more. You might have to lay some a, a greater distance of fiber optic line. You might have to use satellites to broadcast TV. But the idea that you can that one person could block it 
is just not true. Now, here's the thing. When politicians are really inter interested in going th getting things at strange and bizarre angles, they're super good at it. Just look at all the gerrymandering all across the country where you see districts that are carved in such strange and bizarre directions. The same can be done much more easily with an electric wire. You can make an electric wire go to a 90 degree angle or a 20 degree angle, or, or you can have a dump double back on itself. There's, there's nothing that a, one person could do that could in any significant or meaningful way block access to utilities for an entire community or even to just one house. It simply cannot be done. So my position on is eminent domain needed to, to deal with this until such a point as there exists some type of utility that where that rule would apply, I would say the question is meaningless. And I'm sure if such a thing ever exists, the next thing to be developed would be a way to allow that whatever futuristic thing is to go at a 90 degree angle. So no, I would not support any kind of eminent domain on that. And I do think that anyone who believes that that is necessary for utilities just doesn't understand the behavior of electricity, of fiber optics, of gas under pressure, or of water under pressure. Pressure. I guess if I ask a statist question, I deserve to get treated like a statist. Uh, Max Abramson, you get the closing, question, uh, closing comments on this. Uh, just require that uh, private companies, if they really, really, really need access to a section of uh, private land, uh, pay uh, one and a half times what the, the property is worth or what the devaluation is. The Fifth Amendment of the Constitution says that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. Um, I watched a, a film called uh, The Little Pink House, where a, a big pharmaceutical company came in and they basically used the city to come in and, and, and force people off their, their property. And that decision went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court totally misunderstood public use. And public use has been twisted around to mean almost anything from job creation or economic redevelopment or whatever excuse that they want to use to uh, violate your Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, the, the, the question really does come down to a dollar amount. That is, that when we've talked to property owners, almost every single one, there was a, a price that they were willing to, uh, to uh, sell their land for or sell uh, use or access to their land for. And what we've found pretty consistently is that these companies are just uh, using the courts and violating your constitutional rights to give you far, far less than what the fair market rate is. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there is a, a, a possibility because this question of just compensation hasn't been thoroughly de defined in the Constitution, um, we may have a bill introduced in New Hampshire to provide a definition to add to the Fifth Amendment to explain exactly what just compensation includes and doesn't include. Uh, of course, there have been 40,000 uh, proposed amendments to the Constitution and only 27 have ever passed. Uh, but this one, there's a lot of interest in getting something done on the question of just compensation, making sure that if people have to move, that that's paid for. If there's real devaluation of the land, if people can no longer uh, benefit from quiet enjoyment of their land. Um, and I, th I think that this is one, this is a constitutional question where we have to uh, improve the bill of rights, improve the wording to make it clear that your, your land is your land. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, while the United States contributes own almost no plastic to the ocean directly, we transport massive quantities to foreign nations who then in turn dump our plastic into their ocean. Is the United States under no obligation for this trash? We'll start with Daniel Berman. Sorry, repeat that one more time. You bet. While the United States contributes to almost no plastic in the ocean directly, we transport massive quantities to foreign nations who then in turn dump that our plastic into their ocean. Is the United States under no obligation for this trash? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, we, we there's a lot of different ways to look at this. Um, what you know, when we talk about plastic, um, Plastic is pretty nasty, um, you know, considering that a lot of it ends up in whether it's landfills or, or overseas, wherever it ends up, um, the stuff doesn't decompose well. Um, and yet we have hemp based plastics and, and plastic alternatives that do. But of course, uh, they're illegal to produce or very difficult because of government regulation. Um, 
we need to get that government regulation out of the way because people like people don't like trash. I mean, that's why we throw it away. That's why it ends up in the ocean because people don't like it. They want to get rid of it. So, you know, they want something else. And if they have something else to use instead, they'll use it. But you have government preventing it. Um, one other thing I want to, you know, since we're talking about plastics, you know, the government always comes in and says, oh, we're going to save the world. We're going to ban plastic bags. Okay, well, so you get rid of plastic bags, but the reality is when you go to the grocery store and you don't have plastic bags to take your shit home, uh, all of the stuff that you're buying has so much more plastic in it that you're really solving like 0.01% of the problem. I mean, they have apples in plastic packages, all these pre-made, uh, pre-packaged microwave dinners in, in plastic packages. Everything comes in a plastic package, even your, your um, uh, you know, orange juice is plastic containers or the, these like cardboard, plastic coated cardboard containers. All of this stuff is more plastic and you know, they, oh, we're gonna ban plastic bags and ban straws and that's like such a small part of the problem. Uh, focus on creating the alternatives that people actually want so that we don't have trash and the problem will solve itself. Just get this bastard government out of the way. <laughs> that's uh, two coins in the swear jar today, Daniel. <laughs> uh, next up is Arvin Vora. Uh, you know, Dan Dan is right about the plastic. Thing. I mean, the way the government handles it is proof of why people should study math. They should study geometry. They should study surface area and volume and understand that if every single object in a plastic bag is coated with plastic, that is more plastic than the entire plastic bag. That's why education is important. That's why we need to have education handled by private industry and why we need to get rid of incompetent government schools that leave people thinking that just because a plastic bag enwraps the entire thing, it is more plastic than the tons of plastic inside of it. Uh, let's get to the actual question though, which is do you have any control? The sovereignty solves environmental problems. Where are these, uh, where are countries dumping plastic? They're dumping it into the public unowned by anybody ocean. If the ocean, if the land, if the waterways are owned by somebody and that somebody has full sovereignty rights, they will keep it out. Notice that even those countries don't take that plastic, find some poor person's house and dump it in that person's house. Because the poorest person, if you try to dump garbage in their house, is going to fight back against you. Instead, they dump it on land that nobody owns, except for maybe a government or in the case of international waters, nobody really owns. We need to allow more sovereignty. Sovereignty is the only weapon that I can think of that is big enough, large enough, effective enough to actually handle the issues created by this kind of environmental pollution. And I know that governments don't like that because it creates sovereignty, it creates competition for them. If you have so many sovereign countries, will anybody want to pay high income taxes? No, because there can be competition. Sovereignty brings other benefits in addition to the environmental, benef environmental benefits. But if you think that having the government get involved, look at, as Dan pointed out, look at their record. They're banning plastic bags. They're banning straws. They're banning the mo most minor parts of, of the environmental pollution while continuing the largest level of pollution ever. If you want to ban Pollution, ban government, ban the military. Those are the biggest polluters on earth. That's where we need to actually start. All right, you're up next, Max Abramson. Thank you. A uh, little bit of a side story. Uh, I'm a state legislator and I serve on the House uh, Municipal and County uh, uh, Committee. And we actually got a number of bills coming through on this very issue. Bans on plastic bags, bans on single-use plastics, bans on plastic straws. And of course, they were passed and we were told, you know, by uh, business groups that these would be very, very harmful to restaurants and grocery stores and uh, and uh, wouldn't actually reduce the total amount of plastic use. So we had the regular group of left wing activists who were there every single day uh, lobbying for almost exactly the George Soros agenda on every single issue, more taxes, more spending, more gun control, more big government. And of course, bans on every type of plastic and every type of pollution. And the funny thing is that, that when it was my turn to kind of cross-examine some of the witnesses, they admitted that it wasn't going to solve the problem, that it wasn't going to make anything make things better. And as we, we kind of delved into the bans on plastic straws and replacing plastic straws with metal straws and paper straws and everything else, um, that actually would not only make the problem worse, but the left-wing activists themselves admitted that it wouldn't do anything, and they would always say the same thing. Well, we've got to do something. Well, why don't you come up with something that 
would actually solve the problem like biodegradables, biodegradable materials that are completely biodegradable, uh, bags that, uh, you know, again, the marketplace works. There are private individuals and private companies out there that are figuring out more environmentally uh, friendly ways to uh, hold groceries together. And uh, I think that if we just uh, let the marketplace work over time, people will work out solutions and we can use boycotts and bycotts as a solution to drive businesses to uh, perform better. That's cool stuff. Uh, Benjamin Letty, you get the closing words again. Can I hear that question one more time, Howdy? Uh, yeah, sure. While the United States contributes to almost no plastic in the ocean directly, we transport massive quantities to foreign nations who then in turn dump our trash into their ocean. Is the United States under no obligation for this trash? Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, whether, whether we are or we aren't, we're going to suffer the consequences. Um, so what, what, what to, what to do about it. I mean, we've I've been talking about plastics for a while here and, you know, I think a lot of this goes back, uh, you know, Berman had said something, he mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the cannabis, you know, uh, you know, or industrial hemp, um, you know, it's kind of amazing, um, you know, what the war on drugs has, has done there. Uh, and made it to where uh, that can't be used uh, because the the weird the strange thing about it is is it's like an incredible uh, renewable resource that grows very very rapidly and uh, happens to be a good source of uh, biodegradable plastic and you know I'll just tell you you know like I've been saying kind of throughout the the night here is that uh, this is all a scam you know uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna short the the plastic bag companies and we're gonna go along the the renewable bag companies and you know i bet you ivanka trump's selling um renewable handbags uh for top dollar and you know this is just this is just all a scam um and you know we're sending them plastic bags and uh, china's sending us you know re renewable you know whatever bags back and uh government needs to get out of this the more influence that we allow uh, you know congress uh and the, and the federal government to have the, the the more that we're just gonna get bamboozled we need to take this back community by community okay thank you so much for that next question candidates the majority of these countries that do dump garbage into the ocean mainly faults no centralized recycling or trash system with so many candidates in this debate who demand smaller or limited or no government at all, what do you make of this citation? Should they be faulting something else instead? Do you believe corporations without restrictions will magically respect the cleanliness of the ocean? And let's go ahead and start with uh, Benjamin Letter. Um, well, if, if somebody, anybody, no matter whether it was government or a private corporation or, you know, us right here tonight uh, were in, engaged in, in, in some kind of you know, massive uh, pollution effort. You know, how would anybody know about it? Um, you know, we need we need watchdog groups out there. We need um, you know people uh, out there uh, you know on on the high seas uh, and, and and you know monitoring what what what's going on. Um, and and that's kind of the beautiful thing about you know the whole concept of of, of the militia or the, or the people. Uh, being able to, you know, go out there and, and participate in, um, in, in, in the activities that, that ultimately are important to, you know, securing, you know, their environment. Um, you know, who's, who, who's going to tell us that, you know, uh, a ship over on the ocean, you know, in some ocean somewhere, they dump something. Was anybody there to, to see it? Um, is anybody motivated to see it? Are they allowed to see it? You know, I, I'm sure that there's a market demand because you know we do see a lot of energy and a lot of passion in in the environmentalist community. And I got to think that if if we had just allowed things to happen there without trying to game the market and figure out how we're gonna you know reallocate our stock portfolios, that people would go out there and 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 engage in this activity and, and find rewarding work. And there'd be competing organizations that, that, that did all this stuff. Uh, and, and, and people would find a lot of enjoyment out of doing something meaningful, but you know, well, with, it's always about gaming the system. So we, we just can't let that happen. 
I think that we should. All right. Uh, Max Abramson, your turn. Is this the, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Uh, certainly. The majority of these countries that dump garbage into the ocean mainly fault no centralized recycling or garbage system. With so many candidates in this debate who demand smaller or limited government or no government at all, what do you make of this citation? Should they be faulting something else? Do you believe corporations without restrictions will magically respect the cleanliness of the ocean? Uh, what would you say about that? No, I don't think that either corporations or, or governments, foreign governments certainly um, are going to respond. When people don't care um, about what they're doing, when they, people don't care about the, uh, the uh, impact of what they're doing on other people, they'll, they, they find a workaround somehow. I have to disagree with Arvin. Um, I've looked into the sovereignty issue over the years, and certainly if land has value, absolutely people do take care of the land. Um, but when there isn't a sellable value, I, I was asked a, a question a long time ago by, uh, say, kind of a center-left activist. He asked, well, what about deserts and what about uh, large sections of land that don't have any economic value? What about the oceans that don't have any economic value or Antarctica or something? People could, people could just dump any amount of garbage in Antarctica or plastics or plastic straws or whatever they want to get rid of. Um, and in fact, what we found, is, as I mentioned earlier in the debate, was that most of the Superfund sites are on federal lands because they have no value. Where there, there are private lands around the world, deserts, in areas that have little or no economic value per acre. Um, as far as how, how would other countries address the problem, how would we solve the problem, um, I think that's something that we have to act in a, a multilateral way, working together with other countries. Um, that care about the problem. And as usual, I would say that usually 90% of the time, the free market figures out a way, entrepreneurs figure out a way, boycotts and boycotts. Um, and again, uh, things like uh, we had a bill come through on industrial hemp. And surprisingly, uh, in New Hampshire, most of the Republicans voted for it. Not all of them. Most of the Democrats voted against it. But I think industrial hemp... Uh, making plastics, making materials out of it. It's certainly biodegradable. And um, even when you have naturally occurring uh, compounds and materials that don't completely break down, um, they don't do damage to the environment like a lot of synthetics do. Okay, coincidentally, Arvind Vori, you're next. It's no surprise I'm gonna disagree with Max on this, but also Hody, I'm gonna have to disagree with you as well. Uh, you've, you've created this false dichotomy where there's the, the world is divided between government and a special group of privileged individuals who have been granted limited liability by government. The, the corporation, a corporation is by definition somebody that's buying limited liability from the government. It is not pure free market by any stretch of the imagination. So before we start comparing having a corporation versus government debate, let's realize that that's like a Democrat versus Republican debate. That's the same team, just two parts of that one team. Oh, to, to Max's point, the idea that that desert land, for example, has zero value, I don't think that's true because I'll tell you this, if any one of us could buy all of Las Vegas, even though that's just desert land, we would. Sovereignty rights give land value because you can set different laws, different taxes, and different codes on that land. What makes Las Vegas valuable, and what makes other parts of Nevada valuable, is not the natural resources of that land. But the simple fact that on that land, you can create competition. You can say, here some things are going to be legal that are not legal elsewhere. Here some things are going to be cheaper that are not legal, that are, that are more expensive elsewhere. Here we're going to do our best to give you the kind of services that you want. So you come here to spend your money here. That's the value of sovereign land. So the idea that you could have sovereign land that has no market value to me is an economic absurdity, especially sovereign land near a major industrialized country like the United States, the, the value would be astronomical. Consider this. To this point, people have tried to buy sovereign land and countries have refused point blank, even cash strapped countries. It could be because they think it didn't have any value and they didn't want to saddle somebody with something valueless, or perhaps they recognize that any sovereign land has value and because it's valuable, people do their best to environmentally protect it. Okay, and uh, bring us home on this one, Daniel Berman. Yeah, so uh, I, I wanna add to what Arvin said about you know the desert being uh, 
having value. Um, Las Vegas has, I, I believe they have a lot of salt mines. Um, deserts are great for solar farms. And it's also a really great place if you want to get away from everybody because you know like it's not a good place to go hang out for your uh, for your vacation. So if you wanted to plant like a big like, you know, extraterrestrial research facility or something in the middle of the desert, that's a great place to do it. Um, but uh, uh, jokes aside, um, we talk about, you know, should government solve a problem? Here's the thing. I see this all the time. I see a lot of really excited people who want to solve a problem. They're like, hey, somebody should do something about this. And the government's like, oh, yeah, give us all your money and we'll save this rainforest. We'll, we'll stick a sign on outside of it. Uh, yeah. So give us millions of dollars and we'll spend like $100 protecting it. That's government. I mean, like, you know, like Ben keeps saying, everything the government does is a scam. Um, if, if people, you know, my grandfather, he grew up in a time where, you know, this was, it, he was born probably a few years after the income tax was, was implemented. And so, you know, he grew up in a time where not everybody was paying income tax and it wasn't a big burden, especially on the working class. He was always sending money, donating to, to like wildlife uh, preservation societies, like these private charities and organizations that were like, hey, we're going to take care of this problem on our own. And he kind of grew up in that culture. Now we have this culture where everybody's like, oh, yeah, government here, take all our money because, yeah, you're going to go save all the rainforest for us. That's not how it works. And we have to stop doing that. We need to start saying, look, if we believe that these things should be protected, get government out of the way. Stop giving them your money. We can do so much with it on our own if we keep the money ourselves and give it to, you know, invest it in these places. And we stop giving the money to government to hire overpriced employees who don't really care about what they're doing and just do the things ourselves. We, we could get so much more done. Stop trusting government to do this. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Last question, then we'll do an open forum for just a couple of minutes. And I know we got a late start, but I want to respect your guys' bedtimes, especially those of you on the East Coast here. Uh, animal testing has helped us solve many problems for humans at the expense of extenimal, extensive animal cruelty, suffering, and death. Are animals just property to be used, abused, and disposed of? Would you object to the studies that put cancer in rats or lipstick in the eyes of puppies if it helped gain safety for human beings? And we will start again with Daniel Berman. Man, that's a tough question because um, I really love animals. Um, but, you know, there's I, I think there's a really deep philosophical question. It's easy to say, like, oh, yeah, look, we want to save these animals. Um, but at the same time, a lot of animals, they're, you know, they're I don't want to say as dumb as plants. But why would, would anyone have would anyone be offended if we did experiments on plants? Probably not because they don't feel. But actually, we do find out that plants do feel and they, they do communicate um, at, a, at a very basic level. And then, then, you know, oh, yeah, rats are stupid animals. And then we find out, oh, they're actually really smart. Same with pigs. Um, so, you know, and I realize at the same time, these are animals that we experiment on because their biology is very close to our own. So it's a very difficult, uh, question to answer. Um, I think if, if the research is geared more towards, um, uh, you know, creating safety for human beings, then we have to say, okay, look, ultimately animals are at the bottom of the food chain. Um, and you know, this, you know, we're protecting ourselves um, at their expense, the same way we feed ourselves at their expense by eating them. As long as we're not doing it to, to like torture them, uh, I, I think that's, you know, that kind of, that's, that's where the philosophical debate is on intent. Now, at the same time, if you're talking about experimenting on animals for things like, like lipstick, which is kind of a, a frivolous concept, um, I, you know, I think that's a little bit irresponsible. If you're talking about life-saving drugs, I think that's a little bit more acceptable. Um, you know, but we, you know, we, we have to kind of be conscious of what we're doing and we have to, we have to understand it's a gray area and we have to understand that if, if companies are doing this, we should have a right to know, and we should be boycotting their products if we don't believe in that. And I think that's, you know, we don't need government to solve these problems. Okay. Thank you so much, Daniel. Let's take that over to Arvin. Uh, the simple answer to your question is, I mean, I, I eat meat, I subsidize the killing and you know subsequent eating of animals so i don't have a very sentimental view of of how to how animals should be used at the same time there are basic standards of decency that i think most people can agree on i don't think this is something that government should regulate because the government is too incompetent to regulate something like this what what we should do is a rely on the natural moral intuition that most people have 
I don't think that most people enjoy torturing animals. I think that, you know, many of the scientists that I've spoken to that do experiment on animals, they, they find it's very difficult and they try to minimize that as much as they can. Uh, you know, for things like lipstick, if you aren't sure if the things you're putting in your lipstick might or might not kill you, maybe you should try different ingredients. And there's been a huge movement towards natural and organic lipstick where the ingredients are things that everyone basically knows are not going to do any massive damage. These bizarre synthetic chemicals, all the unpronounceable names, those are things that I would generally advise people to stay away from. If you're not willing to eat something, you probably shouldn't put it on your lips because that's dangerously close. And if you, no matter how careful you are with it, you're probably going to end up eating at some point a tiny bit of lipstick. Try not to get eat the lipstick that has a bunch of dangerous chemicals in it. But when it comes to something like you know testing life-saving drugs or whatever on animals, of course. I mean, I, there, there's, I don't think there's any question that if we're going to choose between testing a life-saving drug on a rat, testing it on a human child, or simply not testing it at all and just you know letting people suffer... I don't think that's a very difficult dilemma. And for me, it's certainly not a difficult dilemma. I don't think that anyone would enjoy any aspect of it. But if that's what, you know, is what scientifically is the most advisable thing to do, then that is what we should do. Okay. Thank you so much for those thoughts. And Max, a Max Abramson, your turn. Uh, only if it's out of necessity to prevent uh, human suffering, illness, cancer, or death. Um, I think that uh, we already have within the common law, um, one of the reasons I think that we need to go back to the common law is that you have a, a right under the old common law doctrine of necessity to take actions that would normally be considered illegal, but if it's to prevent uh, injury or uh, illness or death to others that you're allowed to do it. Um, and I would say the same thing with uh, animals. Animals should be treated uh, kindly wherever possible, that they should not be, they should not be harmed um, the federal government spends millions and millions of dollars a year on cruel animal studies, drilling holes into the backs of dogs' heads. And some of the sillier, sillier ones are uh, trying to teach mice to study. I think they spent $2 million trying to teach mice to, to stutter. Sorry, I guess I stutter myself. Um, but uh, the federal government shouldn't be making things worse. Um, but I would say if, if you're going to perform studies that involve animals, um, it's got to be driven by human safety. That's the only justification that, that I can think of for uh, for uh, any type of testing on animals. You know, the, the studies that they, the private studies that they have where they have chimpanzees uh, putting lipstick on themselves to find out if it causes lip cancer. Um, it is kind of silly, but uh, if it's driven by necessity, you've got to allow it and uh, otherwise it shouldn't be allowed. Okay. Closing thoughts on this question from Benjamin Letter. Um. This, this question is kind of personal to me because uh, I, I've spent my, my entire life, you know, working working with animals uh, as, a, as a profession uh, and as, as a hobby. Uh, and through um, the experiences that I've had, um, it has forced me to rethink the, the human-animal relationship. Um, there's there's a lot more going on in there and you know i guess this really gets down to a, an issue that is you know a fundamental concept that it, it gets talked about a lot within the, the libertarian community and that's consent and um who deserves to uh have the right to consent versus who or what doesn't have the right to consent and do we know if you know, how do we know if the, the animal uh, sh should have a right to, to consent? And it, seeing what I've seen, you know, I, I I tend to think that there 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 needs to be a, a deeper conversation there. Um, and we should get back in touch with nature and in our communities. Ultimately, kind of like what Arvin you know said, you know, and. and something that I wanted to say too is, is what are you putting in the lipstick? What are you putting in the shampoo that you feel that you need to test it out on uh, an animal that uh, obviously didn't uh, sign a contract or, 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 or away any consent uh, at all for such a thing. Um, and, and we've, we've seen and heard the horror stories of the stuff that, that happens, but ultimately the so solution is, is things like uh, community farmers markets 
and, and, and things of this nature where, you know, like the guy across the street, he's got chickens, uh, occasionally brings me some eggs. I know where these eggs come from. I, I like that. Uh, I take that whole element out of it by, uh, you know, trying to buy locally and encourage, uh, you know, local production and, you know, and, and that local economy is ultimately the solution. All right, candidates, let's just take a couple minutes. I know we want to get to our closing statements. I know we got started late, but I did want to get to the open forum. I do have one question again from our old buddy, William Hurst, who was running with us until just a few weeks ago. But he asked, if a company attains a property and starts a business that poses significant risk to the people near it, should the people be able to deny that business the ability to operate? Or should the people be forced to move or need to move uh, in in order to operate? Or should the people... uh, just deal with it. Uh, if there's a risk to the environmental contamination, how would you handle this situation with or without the EPA? Again, this is open forum, so go ahead and uh, whoever wants. Well, I'm on my do the bastards. Uh, yeah, t- no, it, first off, if there is damages, people have the right to sue, um, and that's just a given. So if 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 there are damages, people people can sue, uh, and if they've damaged the community beyond repair, people can sue, and and they're justified in suing for enough to compensate them for that and to relocate uh, and for the damages that, that, that they were put through by said company, uh, which makes it not very profitable because it's not profitable to be a company that's getting sued and having all your money taken all away. So, or they'll just figure out a way to be cleaner about it so that they, they don't cause the problem so that they won't get sued. Exactly. Uh, I think the libertarian stand- standpoint is, is pretty clear here, which is do what you want as long as you're not hurting somebody else. And if you are hurting somebody else, whether we find a free market mechanism, which we found in so many different areas, ranging from Amazon to eBay to to settle disputes without the government, or whether it's some other methodology that the private sector comes up with to settle the disputes. But ideally, every business knows creating disputes, creating ill will, antagonizing your neighbors is not a smart way to run a business. And so at the end of it, I do think that this is something that the free market, perhaps moderated by dispute resolution, also created by the free market, which it has already done so well, is the is the solution here. But at a, at a moral level, yes, if somebody does something to you, you have the right to redress. Well, I'm on my town's planning board, and right now uh, we're handling a similar issue right now um, where uh, there's a, a an existing company that's changed its use. It's changed its use to something that that causes harm to other people in the, in the area who've been there for a long time also. Um, and people want our planning boards to serve as kind of an arbitration board, but you really can't do it. But I've, I've said uh, on the planning board a number of times at public meetings, On one hand, you have the right to reasonable use of your own land, and you also have the right to be free from unreasonable use by others. We have a provision in our zoning laws that's actually a it's actually a general use. You know, it's a general ordinance. It doesn't really have to be in zoning, and probably shouldn't be in zoning uh, since it's enforced by the you know the selectmen rather than the planning board. But it basically says that uh, you know surrounding property owners have the right to be free from pollution uh, fumes. Uh, noise and other things that uh, emanate from the property. So um, I think this, uh, the, this is a typical example where the, the, the state laws don't allow us to do what we need to do. They don't give us the authority to say yay or nay to a particular activity. And it was something where we had to, had to, had to, sorry, had to hand the issue off to the selectmen in order to uh, have them enforce it. And of course, you know what the selectmen did? They just handed it right back to the planning board. So that's one of those unfortunate things that's just going to go on and on and on. Whenever you stutter from now on, I'm just going to do animal testing on you. That's just the thing that pops into my head. I'm like, oh, should we give Max cancer? See how we can cure it? (laughs) I'm just messing with you. Uh, One more thing, just real quick. Would any of you guys object to voluntary humans replacing these humans in these studies? What the what? Would any of you be opposed to humans voluntarily replacing animals in these studies? There are, they do a lot of, I actually did some of those studies. I mean, nothing too crazy, but when I was growing up, uh, when I was a teenager, like, yeah, you can, you can, um, you know, you know, it's, it's kind of like donating blood or participating in studies or, or, you know, these kind of things. Sometimes they'll, they'll take blood samples or whatever. Um, they let you do that. But, you know, going back to what I said earlier about property, um, and, and I'm actually writing a pretty complicated, uh, study about this, about how, 
you know, like having having property tax kind of forces us to say, oh, my God, there's a false uh, sense of scarcity. We need money. And if that's how you're forcing people to need money so that then they're like they're volunteering for these studies because they like, oh, my God, I need money or I'm, or the government's going to kick me off my land. Um, then no, like that's not really voluntary. But if it's completely voluntary and there's no sort of coercion for that, then yeah, absolutely. I think the best example of this is, is right to try. I mean, people who themselves have a disease, they're saying, well, I have nothing to lose. It might benefit me. It might not. But, you know, why not? Why not try? And I think that things, legislations like that, you know, right to try and whatnot are an example of people legitimately voluntarily saying, yes, I do want to try because I'd rather take a maybe than a definitely you're going to die. I think the question that people all across the world need to reconcile is, do, do you own yourself? Do we own ourselves and, 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 and to what degree and how is that, how is that defined? That's the conversation I think, you know, of this century, you know, that is important. You know, do we as individuals, do we own ourselves? And what does that mean? All right. Who guys, owns your I, body? I, oh, go ahead, Max. Who owns your body? I've asked that question on the floor of the house and I've asked that question committee a number of times. I'd like to think that as an adult and as an American that I own my own body and I have the right to decide what I want to do with it. You, I've said this at a number of speeches a number of times. You have a fundamental right to decide what to put into or take out of your own body. You have the, the right to decide what you're going to put on, on your body, breathe in, eat, drink, smoke. Those decisions are all yours. The government doesn't own your own body. Social libertarianism is fundamentally about the fact that you own your body and no one else does. You have a uh, you have personal ownership of it. And I think, like you know, to to add to this, just I, I mean, there are a lot of studies that are already like this. Um, you can you can voluntarily participate in them, um, and I think they already do a really good job of this and just making sure that like you understand that like you could be getting a drug, you could be getting a placebo, you could have potential side effects. Um, you know, you know what you're getting into. Like it shouldn't be like, oh yeah, we're you know like let us stick this needle in your arm and we're going to, you know, and that's all, you know, and then you inject them with something that you already know to be extremely dangerous. Um, you know, I think there, there does need to be full disclosure or else, uh, you know, again, that's a common law, um, issue. So, so, you know, that's, that's, that's fraud. So, uh, you know, it's something we, we don't need government to regulate, but that's something to consider for that. Well, the ability to communicate consent too, because, okay, just like with the animals, how do we communicate that? What if, what if I speak a completely different language? You know, do I, do I understand what I'm, what I'm consenting to? Um, I, and, and do you own yourself? Um, but yeah, people, at least, at least people that, you know, speak the language and can comprehend whatever the agreement is, at least they have the ability to consent to this. All right, candidates, thank you so much for your conversation uh, today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up my thoughts mostly right here. Please, if you're listening to this, please share uh, this episode. We had an unprecedented explosion thanks to be sh being shared on NBC's uh, uh, Twitter, and that was awesome. Just great response from that one. And uh, we're just uh, – I'm grateful for the response. I'm grateful for you guys taking your time. We've got the last debate coming up in two weeks. After that point, these candidates will have given 40 hours of time uh, to just the debates. That doesn't even include the introductory <laughs> interviews. Uh, they've done a great job. They, it's meant a lot to me. Uh, it's meant a lot to this platform. It's meant a lot to the voter to get to get to know you guys. I know we're, we're working with the LNC right now to try and get some more um, coverage for these for these debates, um, and that's going hit and miss and whatever, but I'm just, I'll am just i just be happy to see it out there regardless of whether the Libertarian Party officially chooses to share it or not. I really am just uh, grateful to be able to have a role in this and, and for you guys for donating your time. So with that being said, let's get your three minutes closing statements on the environment, and we will start with Daniel, Taxation is Theft Berman. Um. I am Dan, taxationist Theft Berman. Um, I will clean your environment without taxes. I can show you that this can be done. Um, this is something, you know, we don't need government to tell us how to live our lives. We don't need government to tell us that we don't want to live in a filthy world with dirty air and dirty water. We already know we want clean air and clean water. Um, you know, we just need a government that's going to respect our own property rights and our own right to protect ourselves against polluters. Um, we don't need government to do it for us because they're a scam. 
they're, you know, we can do a better job of protecting ourselves than government can because we care about ourselves and government doesn't. They care about money. Um, so I'm Dan Taxation Steph Berman. My website is berman2020.com. Check me out. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere else, uh, Twitter, um, and Taxation Steph, if I didn't say that before. <laughs> I believe you mentioned it in your middle name, my friend. Uh, Benjamin Letter, your, your turn. Ben, I believe you're muted. Yes, again. I, okay, I got you. Got you. So um, I think that no matter how uh, people uh, as individuals personally feel about many of the, the issues that we discussed tonight, um, that the, the real solution is going to come from getting involved in, in your, your local government, your, your city and your county level governments first and foremost, because, you know, uh, the, the, the zoning boards and the, the water districts uh, and, you know, all of these uh, government uh, entities that we, you know, really don't spend a lot of time thinking about because we're all focused on, on, on the presidency, but there's like half a million elected officials in this country. And while we're all focused on, on the presidency, um, there, all, the, all of this is happening, you know, in our communities. Um, and, and across various communities uh, across the country, but it, it's, it all starts at home. And by getting involved in, in the Libertarian Party and in, 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 the, in the pursuit of liberty in our lifetime and, 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 and the journey of, of defining uh, what that means, um, in, in taking that into your local city councils and, and, and local county commissioners and water districts and you know, all the things that we've discussed, the zoning boards, um, you can uh, take control of the destiny of, of your community, uh, and then and then from there in the state houses and, and state assemblies, and, and utilize state rights because a lot of this is happening on, on the state level as well. But it's it's up to us to decide, and and government cannot be formed by the people if the people will not engage. And we see a massive amount of non engagement, um, and by many of those people still care it's not that they don't care it's just that they've lost hope and hope is going to come from getting involved in, in your local uh communities and, and local campaigns and local candidates and, and changing those issues identifying those problems and coming up with solutions that make sense for for your community so my website's uh, benletter.com uh once again guys uh i really enjoyed uh, another great debate all right. Thanks so much, Ben. And let's go to Max. Max Abramson. Uh, MaxAbramson.org is my website. I also have uh, Max Abramson 2020 on Facebook. If uh, you're only on social media, um, I do take uh, Bitcoin, of course. Um, get government out of everything. Um, I have uh, very much the same uh, answer to uh, this and other issues, which is let's just get back to the Constitution. Uh, we had a constitutionally limited or very limited government for almost 200 years. We saw much greater advancements in environmental protection, worker safety, traffic safety, reductions in poverty, uh, and other problems. When we took care of problems at the local level, um, I think that the environment is no exception that, that through the private sector and through local action, through boycotts and boycotts, um, we can, uh, uh, through, uh, projects like, uh, the, uh, the X Prize um, and uh, similar efforts that through the private sector, we can get a lot more accomplished than we could ever get accomplished by uh, waiting around for the federal government to do things. I think that um, that our our best opportunity is to develop a very simple, straightforward approach on uh, environmental issues. Um, and the reason is that independent voters, when we look at the whole list of issues that independent voters tell us that they care about, when I go door to door, when I look at, at polling data, the number one issue we keep hearing about are our environmental concerns. And that's why, um, as a legislator, I've been willing to break from, when I was a Republican, break from the Republican Party and uh, vote for better environmental protection. But the best option, the best advantage we have as a third party is the fact that we're a third party. We're not beholden to the oil companies. We're not beholden to the chemical companies. We're not beholden to the, the coal companies or uh, uh, any of these other special interest groups involved in Solyndra and some of the other uh, scandals that have come up. 
It's the fact that we're a principled third party. That's our best selling point on the on the environment. It's the one that uh, people pay attention to. And uh, when we're out there campaigning and we're out there going door to door, talking to people, emphasize the fact that we're a third party. We're not in the back pockets of big business or big polluters. Okay, thank you so much, Max. And we get the closing from Arvin. I want to begin by asking, as Hody did, if you are a libertarian activist, there are two things you need to do. First, if you're running a county page, a county chapter, a state page, state chapter, whatever, share this, get this out there. And if you're not, speak to your LNC regional rep. Listen, I was on the Libertarian National Committee for three terms. I've known the inner workings of it. And I know that there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the LNC to essentially hold out and to make sure that they've paved the way as much as possible for whichever major party dropout ends up being their preferred nominee, the, the person that they believe will help, help them the most with fundraising. But they don't want to wait. So many are waiting for any excuse. And the number one way that they can do that is if you ask them to. When you're on the LNC and, somebody's, and, and, a, and anybody in your district says, or anybody in your region says, can you push this out there? It gives you a huge impetus that's just, even if it's just one person, just you can make that huge difference. And getting these debates in front of the, the massive, the hundreds of thousands, nearly millions of people that we can reach, that the LNC can reach, will make a huge difference in American political discourse. Let's talk a little bit though about environmental policy. Environmental policy, I think, basically comes down to one thing, and that's sovereignty. If you own land, you do whatever you can to protect it. If that is your land where you're setting lower taxes and better laws and private roads and whatever else, you are also gonna wanna make sure that people are not dumping toxic chemicals in that, in your country, in your private 100% sovereign nation. That's what we should do. The sovereign nations in America, the semi-sovereign nations, the Indian tribes in America, they wanted to be able to do that. And instead they were steamrolled by the federal government that would not stand up for the treaties that they had signed. That's what we see. So we see that those who have sovereign rights try to defend the environment. And only when somebody like the US government stops them from doing that, that's the only thing that prevents them from doing that. Sovereignty is the solution. When it comes to worldwide adoption though of, of green technologies, we have to remember this. Just as affirmative action doesn't work for race, Subsidies for green energy don't work for energy. If you hold those, the green energy at a lower standard, then while people might grudgingly buy it in the United States, fulfilling the goals of crony capitalists, they're not going to buy it in other countries. They're not going to buy things in other countries unless those things are better, unless they can legitimately and completely compete in a free market. Just as with a cell phone screen, people prefer low power cell phone screens because they give longer battery life. They compete correctly and freely in an open marketplace. And that's how you're going to get the worldwide adoption. Listen, it's not America warming, it's global warming. And that means we need we need products that can compete globally without any kind of US government subsidy. The way to solve the environment, open competition, sovereignty. My name is Arvind Vora. My website is votevora.com. All right, candidates, again, thank you so much, audience. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you in another two weeks for our 10th and final debate on ma microeconomics. Uh, we've already done the macroeconomics. You can find all of these debates, all nine of them, all 10 of them will be archived on wearelibertarians.com. You can find the previous eight, and we'll work on getting the ninth uploaded tonight. Again, thank you so much for your can for uh, candidates for your time, audience for listening. Please, like they said, uh, if you're a county state, whatever level person, please help share this. Please help get the word out. Uh, candidates love all of the attention, negative or positive. So even if you hate them and you want to share it for that reason, we'll take it all. Even I'll take it, even if you hate me. So again, thank you so much, guys. Again, we'll catch you in two weeks. Until that time, keep fueling the fires of liberty. <laughs>